Hi, I'm Caitlin, and this is Book Chats, and I read Enola Holmes the series, so you don't have to. Enola Holmes is a six-book middle-grade series published between 2006 and 2010. The premise, that Sherlock and Mycroft had a much younger sister who was raised outside of many societal norms by their mother, and who outwits them at many turns to remain independent after their mother disappears on Enola's 14th birthday, is excellent. Great premise. Loved it. Each and every time Enola outwits her much-celebrated brothers is a delight. Unfortunately, Enola Holmes as a series is mired in myopic white feminism with each book seemingly choosing a new marginalized group to unfairly malign. Additionally, the first book is really not that good. So let's start with that first book. Now I need to acknowledge here at the outset of this video that this is a series written for like eight to ten year olds. It's not just middle grade, it's kind of a younger middle grade. In fact, probably a good comp title would be like the Boxcar Children series, which I read and loved when I was 20-ish years younger than I am now and haven't picked up since then. So maybe if I picked up those books, I would feel like they have the same kind of flaws or problems as this series does. Maybe I'm unfairly being too harsh to the Enola Home series because I am a 31 year old, not an eight to 10 year old. But I do want to talk about them either way because I think that some of the problems I have with them are less about how old I am uh, and more about what I expect from books that were written and published in the 21st century. I'm also going to skip a whole section of my notes that was about like the movie versus the book because like it's just a side note. What I should say here at the beginning is that the book and the movie have significant differences and those differences are not just because the screenwriters chose to pull things from later books into the first movie. In fact, they just sort of made up a bunch of things whole cloth and I don't actually have a problem with that. In fact, I think that a lot of the choices they made were good ones and I personally think the movie is better than the book series. But I just want to say if you've only seen the film here, which I hope you're watching this before you suffer through the books, because I don't think you should read them, as I describe the plot of the books, you might feel like they're significantly different from the movie and it's because yes, they are. So my first problem with the Enola Holmes and the case of the missing Marquess, Marquess, I'm not sure how you say that. It's British, but it's also French and things that are British, but also French have question mark. <laughs> um, but this first book in the series, which I think is the worst of the series by far, I think that this problem and one other do get better as the series goes on, while as the third problem I will talk about gets worse as the series goes on. But this book has three major flaws and the first of those flaws is the pacing. I think there's also problems with pacing in the movie. I'm not going to get into those here, but the pacing in the book is thus. This, the first book in a six book series, has to introduce two things. One, a mystery that will stretch throughout the entire series and only be solved in the sixth book, and two, a mystery that will be solved in this book so we have some amount of closure. How the author chooses to do this is write the entire first half of the book as if the second mystery, the titular mystery, does not even exist. So for the first half, more than half of the book, a hundred plus pages, we are just reading about Enola. She's at home. Her mom disappeared. She's figuring out what to do. She's like decoding things that she got on her birthday. And I think that this maybe wouldn't be completely out of place if it were maybe 70 pages in a much longer book, 300 pages maybe, because I do think it kind of lays down some important things about Enola as a person and also that we like introduce this mystery of her missing mother that will sustain us through the series but really get very little attention between now and the final book. What it ends up doing is making you feel like you're just struggling through the first half of this book because you know there's another mystery coming up and where is it? And then when we finally get to it in like the last 40% or so of the book, it's just really fast. It's like all squished in and Enola sort of, so this, <laughs> this then ends up being like my second big problem with the book is because that second mystery is just squished into fewer pages than the mystery that will span the entire series. It's super rushed and it's just not 
very clever, which again, might be because I'm a 31 year old reading a book that was definitely not written for 31 year olds. And I'm not particularly well read in middle grade, early reader mysteries, which is really what it feels like this is. But what it ends up being is that Enola basically swings up to the estate where this young 12 year old has gone missing. She very quickly surmises exactly where he's gone. She announces it to his family and then she goes off on her way. Now, I should probably give Enola credit here because she's a outwitting a 12 year old who admittedly ran away because he's been so babied and underestimated by his mother. And also, too, none of the adults in the series have really figured this out either. Because again, the whole theme of the series is that Enola outsmarts the adults in her life. Anyway, I'm not gonna give the whole thing away, but basically Enola outsmarts a 12 year old, then gets kidnapped by the same people who kidnapped the 12 year old, and then magically through her character skills, figures out a different mystery and puts an end to this kidnapping ring. All of that happens in like, I don't know, 80 pages? It's not that much time. It's really squished. It ended up just feeling too pat and luck based for my taste. And I think even if it had been spread, like even if the same sequence of events had happened, but maybe it had been spread out more throughout the book, I would have enjoyed it more. It's really hard to tell. But in this book particularly, it frustrated me. And then as the series continues on, it's really like, hit or miss whether or not the mysteries are heavily influenced by luck or not, and whether or not Enola is really like noticing things that are being missed by the adults around her versus just being lucky enough to stumble into them. Your mileage seriously may vary on this point about whether or not these mysteries felt compelling or interesting or sufficiently challenging to you, especially if you are not a 30, 31 year old reading books for people one third of your age. But it was kind of frustrating because despite the fact that the author didn't really have time to develop a more interesting mystery and spent so much time on this mystery that then gets sort of briefly mentioned in each book to date and then plops in at the end in the final novel, what the author did have plenty of time for was paragraphs of Enola spewing common negative stereotypes about the Roma who she personally believes her mother to have run away to join, all of this while using a common exonym, which is a word developed by outside groups for a people group or a place. Um, and this common exonym is considered to be offensive or a slur by many people part of this group today. So many Roma would not use this word to describe themselves today, but there are like uses of it in popular media and you can find examples of people from this group using it. The interesting thing is part of the reason that this word is kind of a slur is because of the long history of it being associated with the same stereotypes that Enola is using it with in this book. Whether and how to use epithets or exonyms common to a time period or class that are known to be offensive or slurs is a conversation I should not be centered in and I should not be leading. But I do think that authors should be thinking about what it says about their characters or the audience for their book when they are choosing to use them. Enola's use and her repeated use of negative stereotypes about the Roma, a people who historically have been persecuted, often in violent ways, and today are still persecuted against, her using these stereotypes and then them never being challenged throughout any of the six books it's a choice. And even in the final book in which we find out the fate of Enola's mother, the book continues to repeat the assumption that all Roma are thieves, which is one of the particularly offensive suggestions that leads to persecution and violence against this group of people that is associated with this exonym that is used in the title of the sixth book. Enola's casual use of slurs and stereotypes doesn't just stay with the Roma, it actually expands throughout the series. So like, let's go on a quick tour. This is an incomplete list of what I noticed and took notes on and remember to tell you about. But the first book, what I specifically remember are the slurs and stereotypes about the Roma. Then in the second book, this is a major plot point. Um, 
Left-handed people, according to Enola Holmes, have dual personalities, one for each hand. I'm not making this up. This is a major plot point in the second book and a minor, like, minorly mentioned again in, like, I believe the fourth book of the series. Um, there's also some class commentary that I noticed starting in this book, although it's possible it started earlier. In this book particularly, what frustrated me is that there's the implication that some union activity the dock workers are getting into could only be stirred up by a power-hungry mesmerist and could not in any way have just been, you know, the dock workers themselves recognizing that their working conditions are unjust and unfair and that they demand better for themselves. In the third book, we end up getting commentary on beauty that I think was actually meant to challenge kind of the ways that society um, evaluates women based on their beauty and then has expectations attached to that beauty. But I think that that aspect of the book ended up being undermined by the fact that the villain has a major and that this aspect is commented on by more characters in the book than the villain's actual bad evil actions. Specifically, the villain is using kind of pro facial prostheses to make themselves look different, and multiple characters mention how that character looks strange and unsettling when they are using these prostheses, and then also Enola sees them without them and is very horrified. I don't think the author was intending for the to be connected so closely to the evil actions that the character ends up making, but it's not not connected to those things. In fact, it's commented on so often, and it becomes such a prominent point of the book, although I think the purpose of that was technically just so Enola could find the person, but it ends up feeling like one of the many reasons that this, auth that this character is bad, and I don't think that's good. There's also definitely classism in this book, again, um, and in the fourth book we just continue use of classism and racial slurs. I honestly think the fifth book made me the most angry because in addition to the classism and racial slurs that we continue seeing throughout the series, there ends up being this really big ableism aspect because Enola just sort of finds out that one of the characters in the book, who is actually a real historical figure that the author has fictionalized in this book, um, is bedbound. And historically, this person was bedbound for like 20 or more years. And historians sort of disagree about why that was. The author knows that. The author actually has an author's note. This is the only book that had an author's note in it. And the author mentions like, yes, this is a thing that is real. Um, historians disagree about what caused it. Um, but in, when Enola initially finds out that the character is bedbound, she sort of spews a bunch of kind of negative misconceptions and stereotypes about bedbound women in society. And then I thought like, okay, maybe in this book that will be challenged when she meets this character. But what ends up happening instead is that the author chose, and the author says in their author's note that they chose to do this, and it is very much a choice. The author chose that instead of challenging Enola's negative assumptions about what people who are bedbound are able to do and accomplish, she's just going to make this character be faking it. So this real historical character who was actually bedbound for a significant portion of her life and managed to achieve a lot of things during that time period, in this author's mind, the thing to do with this character is to say that she's faking it because by faking it, she's able to escape societal norms and expectations that would slow her down and get more done because of that. And that felt really, really ableist and icky and just not okay to have sort of disability erasure of a historical figure. I don't know how this particular historical figure, because there are a lot of questions about what was actually going on in their life, how this particular historical figure is viewed by the disabled community or by the disability community. But I do know that paired with Enola's earlier comments, it just becomes off as really ableist and offensive. And then in the final book, um, we finally get to sort of where Enola's mother went. It's basically just a bunch of Roma stereotypes again repeated, even by Enola's mother, who we find out, spoiler alert, has been living with 
the Roma since she ran away on Enola's 14th birthday. No Roma character in the entire series is ever used as more than a prop or a means to an end for the Holmeses, and they are a group looked down upon even when living among them as Eudoria Holmes did. This as a whole is a pervasive theme for Enola throughout the series. The poor and unfortunate throughout the series are to be pitied, but they're not really seen as equals. The Roma are not real. They're just stereotypes throughout the series. The mores of society are a thing that women who are too weak-willed or not clever enough to escape are subject to and oppressed by. But in Nola, our clever heroine, she was smart enough to take the literal fortune that was stolen for her by her mother from her brother and invest it so that she is not limited by society. And she's also smart enough and has strong enough will not to be trapped by her brothers and by society. Um, not like all of those unfortunate other women who are definitely not limited by the strictures society has put on them. They're just limited by their inability to escape those strictures because they're not rich or smart enough. Enola Holmes is a feminist series. It takes the male-dominated and reportedly misogynist Holmes brothers, I say reportedly because I have not actually read the original source material, and it gives them a smart, precocious sister and a radical mother, and we focus on the smart, precocious sister and a little bit on the radical mother. The Holmes brothers end up developing as characters throughout the series, more so even than Enola, and they start to see Enola's strength, and they start to see the error of their judgment about her. Nola's feminism, though, never really exists beyond her own family or her own self. She falls into the trap of colorblind white feminism that promotes the cause of privileged white women without acknowledging the challenges or needs that exist at the intersection of a woman's race, class, education, marital status, disability level, what all of those things might bring. Look, I'm not saying through this video that white feminism wasn't part of the suffrage movement, that it sprang up whole cloth in the 1960s, or that it was invented for Enola Holmes. But I do think we owe it to ourselves to ask why a book written in the 21st century didn't do better. It's being reported that Helena Bonham Carter, who plays Eudoria Holmes in the movie, that's Enola's mother, <laughs> um, has said that diversity conversations in 2020 Hollywood mean to be made in 2020 and Nola would have to be cast as a black actress. I want to say right here that I disagree with it and I do look forward to Hollywood proving me wrong by casting almost exclusively BIPOC leads for the next, I don't know, 10 years. But I do believe that Enola Holmes, as written in this series, and if I'm really honest with myself, Enola Holmes in the movie as well, could not be cast as black. Enola is a rich white girl because of how she's written, not just because of her casting. Shout out to Millie Bobby Brown, who's excellent in this film and really sells it as a whole. But Enola cannot be separated in this book and really in the movie from her power and her privilege, both from the money she's given and from the color of her skin. So I don't think you should read this series. And it's a bummer because I watched this film and I loved it and I wanted to read something that gave me some similar feelings. And this series is not that. But I do have recommendations for three series and a book that you could potentially read instead and I think would give you some of the Enola Holmes feelings without all of the Enola Holmes baggage. The first of these series that I'd like to recommend is the Agency series by Y.S. Lee. This is a series that is a little, that is set a little bit earlier than Enola Holmes. It's in the 1850s, so, so still Victorian England, but about 30 to 40 years earlier. And it's centered around a girl who is saved secretly from the gallows and ends up being trained to be sort of a spy or operative for an all women's <laughs> spy slash operative agency in Victorian London. She is a white passing biracial character and it's a major part of her journey to kind of contend with the part of her heritage that is not white and to contend with how afraid she is of discovery and also how she can really embrace that side of her heritage. 
this main character also throughout the series is butting heads with a handsome young engineer <laughs> um, who has a lot of feelings and thoughts about what a woman, what a proper Victorian woman is that butts up against Mary and how she acts and is. And it's really interesting and entertaining to see how the two of them kind of negotiate what it means to be in a relationship in Victorian England and what restrictions that places on you. She contends with this throughout the series as she is deciding whether or not she wants to have a thing with this engineer. It was really unsurprising to me when I was researching this series to talk about it more after Enola Holmes to find out that the author Y.S. Lee actually studied Victorian era literature and culture and she's written before about both class and masculinity. I think this series has really thoughtful things to be said about both of those in addition to the main characters white being white passing, to the main character being a woman in London, to the main character character being technically an escaped fugitive. All of this happens in this four book series and not enough people have read it. If that's, I don't know, not your jam for some reason or you've read it and you want more, the next series that I would recommend are Gail Carriger's Finishing School series. This is the prequel series to an adult romance paranormal steampunk series she has. Um, but this is basically if you watched Enola Holmes the film and you thought, what if finishing school but on an airship and actually you're learning to be spies? Because that is what is happening in Madame Geraldine's finishing school in Gail Carriger's finishing school series. This is another YA series, so again, it's not quite the same age group as you know, Holmes books, but I think that it makes sense if you are like me, a 31 year old who watched and enjoyed the movie. Um, the series is also set in the 1850s ish kind of era in Victorian London, and it is kind of this paranormal steampunk London. So there are airships, and there are also werewolves and vampires, and like a society of manners kind of thing. Anyway, this series contains a lot of fun, a lot of kind of I mean spies, finishing school spies. I don't really know much more I have to say about that. It also has at least one sapphic character, which I think is uh, an element that people would want to know about. If instead you watched the Enola Holmes series and you were like, oh, the suffrage movement, I would like more of that. What I will recommend to you is the fourth book in an adult romance series, and that is The Suffragette Scandal by Courtney Milan. Now, I like this whole series, and I honestly think that you should start all the way at the beginning with the novella that starts the series, The Governess Affair, and read all the way through because it has just such emotional resonance and other aspects. But the fourth book technically can stand alone, and you can read it alone and it is the one that has the suffrage movement emphasis. But it is an adult romance and it is sort of an explicit adult romance, so be forewarned about that. The final book that I'm going to recommend to you is not attached to a series, it is a standalone, and it is actually middle grade, so yay! You know, ta-da emoji! <laughs> um, this is Show Me a Sign, and it is about, it is a historical middle grade about a girl who is part of a unique community on Martha's Vineyard that has a lot of deaf people in it. And the main character herself is deaf. And they have a unique kind of Martha's Vineyard sign language they use to communicate with each other and with the hearing members of the community. And this main character at the beginning of the book is struggling with grief over the fact that her hearing brother has recently died and she feels somewhat responsible for his death. Um, she's also dealing with the grief of her parents, one of whom is hearing and one of whom is also deaf. And at the beginning of the novel, some scientists from outside of their community come in and they want to research whether or not there's a physical cause, like in the water or the soil, for why so many people in this community are deaf. I think this is a really interesting book and the author does a really great job of conveying the language that the main character uses with her family and friends and community members. She does a really good job kind of drawing this community for us and allowing us to see this community of kind of outsiders to the rest of society, but how they functioned and were like successful among each other. And eventually the main character does end up going outside of that community and there's a big contrast between how she's perceived outside of the community and inside her community. And it was really thoughtful and informative. 
I, thoughtful and informative makes it sound like it's gonna be a chore, but I have to emphasize to you, I read this book this year as a 31 year old and I gave it three stars because as a 31 year old, I enjoyed it, but it wasn't like my favorite. But I could tell that young Caitlin would have loved this book so much. It gave me serious Dear America vibes actually, even though it's not technically written as like a journal. Um, and I definitely would have eaten that up when I was actually 10 or eight or 12 years old. I don't know, if it had come out then, I would have loved it. So that is the final book I'm gonna recommend. I also wanna just shout out back to the beginning of this video, the Enola Home series. If you have read it and agree or disagree with my take, let me know down below. There's a couple things about the series that I would kind of like to talk about with someone, but I don't think you guys should read it just to talk about those things with me because honestly, by the time you do, I will probably have forgotten them. And also, I don't think it's a good series and I don't think it's a good use of your time. So finally, I just wanna say, I a shout out to the Snark Squad podcast episode on Enola Holmes, the film. That's where I heard about the comments that Helena Bonham Carter made. And also I just really enjoy this podcast and I love listening to it and definitely recommend their episode about Enola Holmes, the film. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys later. Bye.